It is my honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Pastor Brian Jennings. Born in Carthage, Missouri in 1975, he uh, gave his life to the Lord on October the 15th, 1986. Brian currently lives in Tulsa with his wife, Beth, and their four children. Uh, Brian is the pastor and preaches at Highland Park Christian Church. He also serves on two um, really cool boards. Uh, the first one is the uh, board of Ozark Christian College where uh, they are training students for Christian service. But the second board is for Black Box International, which is actually an organization dedicated and focused on holistic care for human trafficked boys and getting them out of that, rehabilitated, and back into society. He's written two books, one, Leading, uh, Lead Your Family, and second, Dancing in No Man's Land, which is a fascinating and wonderful uh, Christian, if you will, uh, work on how to love your neighbor politically and how we can do that as believers. A few fun facts. Unless he's able to regularly hike, jog, or play basketball, he has a leg twitch and it will drive him crazy. He recently has fallen in love with pickleball, which he swears is a sport. And last but not least, if you see him playing guitar for church, that means multiple people have either fallen ill, gotten called into work, or are out of town. Pastor Brian says he is the equivalent of the backup shortstop coming into pitch for an inning. Would you please stand and welcome Pastor Brian Jennings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it's so good to be with you all. Uh, I've had a loaded week of ministry. In the last week, um, I've done a wedding, a sermon, a Bible study, one funeral. I'm doing another funeral, and that funeral just turned into two funerals because the husband died two days after the wife. And kind of crazy. With all of that, I'm, I'm just super glad to be with you all today. This is the most normal thing I get to do uh, this week. And uh, it's really an honor to be with you. And I'm going to challenge you all just for about 20 minutes. And I would just love for, you, for us to ask together uh, that our hearts and minds would be open to what God wants to teach us in these moments. Father, we, we just want to commit uh, these moments as we open up your word uh, that our hearts and minds would be open to hearing from you, to be... Um, open to learning, to being challenged, to thinking in a new way that your spirit is leading us, something maybe we've missed from scripture or in prayer. Lord, we ask uh, that you would help us fully focus on your words during these time. In Jesus' name, amen. On, on, on August 10th, 1863, a frustrated man elbowed his way through a crowd of people to get into the office with the person with whom he most wanted to speak. The man elbowing his way into the room was Frederick Douglass. His audience was President Abraham Lincoln. Douglass, if you don't know, you should read his autobiography. It's one of the finest autobiographies. Douglass was frustrated with Lincoln because Douglass had survived the horrors of slavery. He survived by teaching himself to read, by praying, and hanging on to a glimmer of hope that one day he would be free. And sure enough, that day came for him when he escaped. He got to the north. Soon the nation realized he was one of the most bright and eloquent men on the planet. And so he wrote and he spoke. And one of the things he did was recruit and encourage the U.S. Army to welcome in black troops. He put himself on the line for that, recruiting and talking and pushing and begging and saying this is a good thing. Even his own two sons signed up for the 54th Regiment. But his frustration was that although black men were allowed to be troops, they were treated both separately and unequally in pay and how they were, and even in fighting for their release if they were taken captive. He was frustrated with Abraham Lincoln, and surprisingly enough, that meeting with his frustration would lead to a friendship, and it would lead to two changed minds. I'm going to preach about a word today, and it's the first time I've ever preached a sermon about this word specifically, 
And yet this word is what I hope to accomplish every time I preach. It's what your professors hope they, to accomplish every time they teach. It's what you hope to accomplish when later on tonight you get hungry and you argue with your friends where to go find a bite to eat. The word is persuasion. Persuasion. Are we not all in the business of persuading? And as Christians, ought we not be persuadable about some things and yet trying to persuade others about others? And today I want to show how when it comes to persuasion, two great friendships show us the way. The first is Douglas and Lincoln. And the second, and where I want to go to now, is David and Jonathan. If you have your Bibles, turn to uh, 1 Samuel 20 in, in chapter 19. David is growing in reputation. He's growing in military victories. Uh, he's quite the musician as well. And then Saul tries to kill him because he's jealous. Can you imagine the pressure of playing a stringed instrument, knowing that the, your audience might kill you at any point? Uh, but that was David's life. It was bizarre. But he, he realizes, I mean, he realizes, I can't stay here anymore. Saul even tries to assassinate him in the middle of the night. He flees. He goes see Samuel. He comes back, and he, he meets up with his best friend, Jonathan, who happens to be the son of King Saul who wants to kill him. And that's where we come to chapter 20, verse 1. David now fled from Nioth in Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? He exclaimed, what is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father would not hide anything from me like this. It isn't so. Then David took an oath before Jonathan and said, Your father knows perfectly well about our friendship. And he has said to himself, I won't tell Jonathan. Why should I hurt him? But I swear to you that I am only a step away from death. I swear it by the Lord and by your own soul. Tell me, what can I do to help you? Jonathan exclaimed. We have to look at this story in a couple different parts. And the first part is David says, Jonathan, your dad's trying to kill me. And Jonathan's response is, nah, nah, surely not. You see, it was impossible for Jonathan to think that, that his dad would try to kill such a good person like his friend, David. Ne never mind the times that Saul had actually tried to impale him with a spear, never mind the late night assassination attempt, never mind all of that. Instead, Jonathan says these words, it isn't so. It isn't so flatly rejects the problem and the person. It isn't so is easy to say when the spears aren't flying at you. See, we grow up naturally defending the people in our circles, projecting our experience on others. We naturally dismiss the words of trustworthy people when it conflicts with our own loyalties, our experiences. To say it isn't so is to say, get over it. You're exaggerating. I will not be persuaded. How many times in our nation's history have our black brothers and sisters said, we're in danger, we're not safe, we're being mistreated. And the response has come back and said, it isn't so. Surely it's not as bad as you say. Because my school was fine, yours can't be underfunded. Because my family could own a home, yours had the same opportunity. Because nobody in my family ever feared being pulled over by a cop, neither should you. It isn't so. In 2020, when we watched with our own eyes, the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. For the first time in many people's lives, they said, oh, maybe it is so. And the sad reality is if it were not for the release of the video, I think our broader culture would have stuck with, it isn't so. In the past few years, multiple kids of color in my church and in surrounding churches that I know, have for the first time in their lives experienced racism, 
blatantly, in a bullying way. And for several of my friends, in fact, every single friend of color I have who preaches has experienced the same thing in the last three years, and I just need to tell you what it is. They've been preaching the same message for many of them decades. They've been in the, in the same church structure and system and belief pattern uh, that's preaching the same gospel for years and years and years. But for the first time in all of their preaching, when they preached about how God loves all people and they dealt with issues of racism, they were accused of being Marxist or loyal to CRT or things that they actually came to me saying like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'll tell you what my friends heard. What they heard was people saying to them, it isn't so. Stop talking about it. My beef with Jonathan is that he failed to trust his honest, honorable, best friend. Instead, he chose to trust his own experience more than his godly friend because it would complicate his worldview. It would complicate his life. But, let's give Jonathan credit, good news, when, when David says, hey, no, 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 let me circle back and try this again, and he launches into, it is so, Jonathan does what few people ever do. He's persuaded. He changes his mind. He's like, oh, okay, I trust you. How can I help? What can I do to help you? Do you know what's infinitely better than saying it isn't so? Infinitely better is to say, it might be so. I mean, can't we at least make that step when someone comes to us with their experience and say, it might be. It might be so allows room for discovery. It allows room for investigation and listening and learning, room for friendship. I hear you, I wanna learn more. It salvages the friendship. Biola University President Barry Corey speaks of approaching the public square with a firm center and soft edges. The firm center is your moral core of formed by Christ. But the soft edge is the way in which we approach other people. The open heart, open mind, listening to their experiences. And the Christian needs to be persuadable, right? because we also want to be able to persuade. But if we aren't persuadable, we won't persuade other people. So the Christian is to be persuadable in some matters. Yes, not in all matters, but in some matters, persuadable. But also able to persuade. Jesus persuaded. That was much of his ministry. Why did he meet with Nicodemus late at night on Nicodemus' time? Because he wanted to persuade. Why did he sit down with a Samaritan woman at the well? In order to persuade. Paul persuaded. Acts 14 uses the same word often used for, for persuaded, and it says he won the crowd over. He persuaded them. Acts 17.4, some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Acts 19.26, but as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. Acts 26, while he's on trial, uh, trying to persuade the king, Agrippa interrupts him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? We understand our responsibility to the Lord is the work of persuasion. That's part of who God made us to be is to work with him to persuade other people. We become all things to all people to help persuade. We answer with gentleness and respect in order to persuade. Only God saves. We're not good enough for that. But we partner with him to help persuade other people. So I want to ask this. What do you do when you try to persuade someone and they reject you? They say, it isn't so. It, it, maybe, maybe you're saying, Please, listen to me. No, 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 no. I don't want to listen to you. It, it, it isn't so that your experience is all that bad. Or it isn't so that God is real. It isn't so that Christ cares for you. It isn't so that the Bible has a sexual ethic. Notice David's response. 
He's passionate, but that passion is still bounded in friendship. So three things I just want to mention to you that I see David doing that I think we still need to do today. Number one, when you try to persuade someone and they reject you, stay, if at all possible, stay in the relationship. That's number one. Don't go running away. It's so easy in our culture and in any culture to just go run away, to hit the cancel button and say, I have nothing to do with you ever again. No, 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 no. Stay in that relationship if you can do it. Stay, because that's the first step in persuasion. Number two, speak courageously and persistently. I love that David is willing to circle back and take another shot at it. Jonathan, listen to me. I'll take a vow on this. I promise you, I'm not making this up. Be courageous, be persistent. And number three, wrap all of that in gentleness. Speak gently. Even though, even though David was blunt, he was still gentle. Proverbs 25, 15 says, Patience can persuade a prince, and soft speech can break bones. See, you're all at an academic institution that honors Christ. But the danger of academic learning is that you might learn how to win an argument without winning a person. So be careful. In persuasion, you'll need to address lots of arguments. So get your mind ready. But your job is to win people. So get your heart ready. Both need to be ready. Demonize nobody. Pray for enemies. Speak not of contempt of an individual or a group of people you dislike from a region, a religion, or a political party because those are people to be persuaded. Ready your heart to win them. Let me get real practical about that. If your TV or social media feed or podcast entices you to detest other people, cut it out of your life because it would be more important for that TV or that podcast or that social media service to go to hell than your whole body. And so cut out what pulls your heart away from being formed in the image of Christ. Because we are people in the business of persuasion, and you can't persuade someone well if you hate them. And so get rid of some of that stuff. There is so much stuff out there. I'll tell you, in our own family, the racism that we experienced, my daughter experienced this last year, you can track it straight back to the people who did that to her, to YouTube videos and people that were saying, there's a certain group of people that you should not like. You can track it all right back to media and voices that they heard. They didn't come up with that on their own. And so guard your heart with the stuff out there. May the words of Lincoln be true in your heart with malice toward none, and charity for all. You know, he said that about the South. With malice toward none and charity for all. If you want to read about Douglas, start with his autobiography. There's a gazillion books written about Lincoln. The newest is one of the best. It's about Lincoln's war for peace. That he didn't just want to win the war, he wanted to win the peace. And so it, it details how he worked feverishly and tirelessly trying to figure out once the war is done, how can we make peace with people? And for him, the South had to say, we absolutely were wrong and we were changed and we will abolish slavery. And it had to happen or else it was a non-starter. But once that happened, then we welcome these people back in as fellow citizens and brothers and sisters. And we do everything we can. We don't hold vengeance over them. His fight for peace. Lincoln's second inaugural address may be the greatest political speech in our country's history in which he said that great phrase. But by the time he delivered it, he had Douglas's full admiration. Douglas had learned that he could trust Lincoln, that Lincoln actually had uh, his, his best interest at heart. The feeling was mutual. Lincoln moved from being primarily concerned about just holding the union together to also being concerned for all people, especially former slaves, and those who would be freed. And so after that second inauguration, there was a party. 
and uh, all these people coming around wanting to come up and be able to be with the star of the, of the speech, Abraham Lincoln. Frederick Douglass made his way in as well, and some people didn't like him being there. Before any harm could come to him, Lincoln said, Ah, oh, there's my good friend Douglass. And Lincoln, it said, walked over to him, and he said, There is no man in the country whose opinion I value more than yours. And he said it loud enough for everyone to hear. And so he asked Douglas, what did you think of the speech? And Frederick Douglass replied, that was a sacred effort. A month later, Lincoln was shot and killed, and Douglas said, today is a day for silence and meditations, for grief and tears. Like David and Jonathan, Douglas and Lincoln were able to persuade and be persuaded. They stayed in the relationship even when they disagreed. They spoke courageously and persistently. They also spoke gently. And the training in your life whether, whatever your career is going to be, whatever you do going out from here, but even starting where you are right now will be full of persuasion. And I want to encourage you to consider who are the people you're allowing to persuade you? And are you allowing the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to persuade you? Daily, even hourly. And, and how are you doing at persuading others? Is your mind ready? Is your heart ready? Are you on a track to ready your mind and ready to your heart to persuade people not to like you, not to be impressed by you, but to love the Lord? This morning, I just want us to read a prayer together that I wrote as I thought about this that can be our prayer together as a college today. Would you just look at the screen and the Let's just read this prayer together. Lord, may we be persuaded daily, hourly by you. May we persuade others to listen to you. May we be willing to consider being persuaded. Grant us discernment. Lord, may we be persuaded daily, hourly by you. Amen. Thank you for being with me today.